The anime story begins with a battle between two great houses, waving their banners on either side. However, both sides settle to a truce, because a greater threat is about to destroy the world as they know it. Right now, the continent of ancient Japan is currently facing a plague against the evil giant demonic dragon, whose name is Zot. This dragon is like no other, and no one has ever been powerful enough to stop it from doing whatever the hell it likes. Every time this dragon awakens, it burns entire towns and villages to the ground, but no one has ever been strong enough to delay these attacks, so people can have enough time to evacuate the area, as he's so overpowered costing millions of civilian lives each time he awakens. However, in this world there are two famous mages who people depend on, and together, they also birth a baby boy, named Hero. One night when all the fighting stopped, these two mages told everyone that they need to seal the dragon tonight before it's too late. So all the soldiers and cloaked men stood together, waiting for the dragon Zot to appear and finally seal him for good. Once the purple moon was out, we see Hero's mother, a famous witch, known for her incredible swordsmanship and her two juicy bouncy balloons. She purposely set herself up as bait, pretending to sacrifice herself to attract the dragon Zot, as it was told the legendary Zot also loves juicy jugs just as much as we do. When she starts screaming out for help, two claws raise from the ground and a giant shadow forms around the ritual and Zot finally awakens again. When he does, he lets out a giant raw and proceeds to attack Hero's mother but at this moment she quickly uses a spell, unleashing herself and puts the chains onto the dragon and pulls out her sword. At this moment, Hero's father, named Byro, transforms from one of the soldiers into his true form and begins the sealing ceremony. Together they start the sealing process forming giant protective bubbles around the beast. However during the process, Byro is struck by an arrow in his back, causing him to fall and bleed out. However he insists that they both continue the sealing ceremony, or the dragon will never answer for his crimes and Zot's flames will destroy all souls and devour the land. However Zot breaks out of the sealing magic and calls Barrow a pathetic noob, and proceeds to attack his son Hero. But while Zot tries to attack, his father uses a spell with his hand saving the boy but this causes the boy and the dragon to have a permanent scar on their chest and right after the dragon uses its flames to destroy the entire ceremony and everything gets blasted into smithereens, leaving only Hero alive because of his father's protective spell. Many years go by, and Hero has now grown up a bit and seeks revenge against all who betrayed his father and also desires to kill the dragon that wiped out his family. Hero is seen wandering about in different areas, cloaked up and carrying a giant sword on his back. He keeps walking until he arrives at a new city where everyone is checked by the guards before entering. However the guard was shocked upon looking into Hiro's eyes and lets him enter without any problems. And he must know it was the son of Byro. He wanders around the town trying to spot anything unusual, and he can see different mysterious creatures and strange foods for sale, until the people in the area spot a small girl who announces the arrival of a lord, named Nambaku. She summons Nambaku and he arrives on a chariot surrounded by many guards and soldiers. Nambaku starts throwing copper coins at the people and calls them all worthless smelly peasants and to bow before him immediately. All the villagers pick up the coins and start fighting over them, and one of them falls next to Hiro. And Hiro tries picking it up but one of the city boy thieves, named Peshate, steals it from Hiro. But the group of city boys tell Peshate not to take Nambuku's money, as he's spreading money that he had taken from them. One of the boys noticed that the Lord Nambuku has the Grand Troa in his chariot, and the Troa will grant any wish you want, and will supply all the money and food they will ever need and will never be poor again. However the leader tells them all to forget it as it's impossible to steal the Grand Troa, and they explain how they need to leave now otherwise the boss will get angry. However, Peshate stays behind and can't help himself after seeing the Grand Troa and climbs onto the chariot but Lord Nambuku notices. After, Hiro wonders some more and he sees a man on the side of the street claiming he has got a rare crest which descended from the hero who defeated the evil dragon. But the man tells a twisted version of the story as Hiro knows exactly what happened that day. But the crest he was holding is real. After one of the boys from the street thieves gang snatches it out of the man's hand and runs away. But the merchant had a giant bodyguard who grabs the boy and raises him into the air. The merchant tells the big bodyguard to punch him three times and take the crest back. But before they could, Hiro appeared just in time and puts his massive blade right against his ugly ogre face, and told the bodyguard that the only time he ever draws for his sword is when he really means it. Hiro tells the merchant he will pay for the crest and after throws the guy a gold coin for the troubles and the coin was worth double for what he was asking. 
after they let the boy go and the merchant thanks Hiro for the kind gesture. However the boy tells Hiro that he just ruined his plan, as he was trying to get the bodyguard to hold him up and scold him for taking the crest so that the other street thieves boys could steal the merchant's items from the shop and their wallets. So Hiro just cost them a fortune by trying to be the nice guy. Right then the boy steals the crest out of hero hands and bolts off down the street and runs away with his street friends. Later on, the boys go back to their secret city hideout and talk about hero being a jerk and ruining their plunder. However hero sneaks inside their base and takes back the crest claiming it belongs to him and none of them have no idea how valuable this is and what it means to him. Hero asks the boy who stole it what his name was and he introduces himself as Tomat. The other boys call Hiro a dumb moron and said that what they steal still belongs to them. So Hiro runs away, and all the boys start chasing him on top of the rooftops and through alleyways. Meanwhile another mysterious man, named Juru, a big scary Jizaw with scars across his face, was also in the market, and was spying around, and asking strangers if they have seen a boy with a big sword named Hiro, with a drawing of the protagonist on a piece of paper. But no one in the market recalls seeing this boy. However Jeru's companion tells Jeru that he's stolen too much from them already, and that this is the first town Hiro would most likely come to visit first. In a grand mansion across town, Nanbuko hosts a lavish dinner for his guests. Despite his facade as a mere merchant, Nanbuko's true colors emerge as he pressures his guests into selling their prized magic items. Concerns rise among the city's elite as they fear the repercussions of rising prices and potential unrest. Tensions escalate when a clumsy servant, who had greeted Nanbuko earlier, accidentally shatters a rare jar. The lord of the city fumes at the loss, but before he can voice his frustration, Nanbuko's armed guards swiftly intervene, their swords drawn, ready to enforce their master's will. As tensions rise in the mansion, the girl unveils the Grand Troa, suggesting a partnership with Nanbuko. Tempted by the offer yet wary of his reputation, the man hesitates. Suddenly, a miniature dragon-like creature swoops in, snatching the crystal with its tongue. The girl, quick to react, uses her magic to open the ceiling, causing both the creature and Peshate to tumble down from above. The next morning, Peshate finds himself bound in the city square, facing execution. Like clockwork, Hiro intervenes, halting the execution with practiced ease. Nanbuko's soldiers move in, but Hiro dispatches them effortlessly. Infuriated, the girl unleashes her lightning magic at Hiro who deftly evades her attacks. Just as the situation escalates, a sturdy stranger appears, rescuing Hiro from harm. Seizing the moment, the girl grasps the Grand Troa, only for Hiro to boldly claim it as his father's possession, sending a ripple of concern through Nanbuko. In a desperate move, the girl channels the Grand Troa's magic, unleashing a powerful blast toward Hiro. With quick reflexes, Hiro manages to deflect the attack, but not before the girl is caught in the blast. The force propels her towards the mountain, causing a massive explosion that shatters its peak. As the dust settles, both the seal on Dagonzot and the emblem on Hero's chest illuminate. Blinded by his thirst for revenge, Hero unleashes a flurry of attacks against the colossal dragon. But to no avail, his efforts are effortlessly thwarted. Just as hope seems lost, Jeru swoops in to aid his friend. The soldiers, realizing their futile attempts against Dagon Zot, redirect their arrows towards Hiro and Juru in desperation. However, before the arrows can find their mark, the legendary dragon unexpectedly shields the duo, surprising everyone with its protective gesture. In a fit of rage, Dagon Zot unleashes its fury upon the city, laying waste to everything in its path before vanishing into the shadows. While the man beside Nanbuko seethes with anger, Nanbuko wears a satisfied smirk, reveling in the fear he has instilled. He delights in the realization that people now clamor for his protection in the wake of such terror. The scene then shifts to the thieves' hideout, where Hiro lies unconscious. Juru recounts the events of ten years past, when Hiro's parents attempted to seal Dagon Zot. Buffer Zone, the chosen site, was strategically located at the heart of three powerful kingdoms. Hiro's mother, Kismitid, sacrificed her soul to lure out the dragon, while Lord Barrow wielded his sealing treasure, and Hiro aided with the sacred mirror. Together with a hundred elite mages, they commenced the sealing ritual, but tragically, their efforts were in vain. Despite Juru's intervention to save Hiro, his parents and all the magicians fell victim to the engulfing black flames of Dagon Zot. As Hiro regains consciousness, he immediately searches for the dragon, driven by a relentless desire for vengeance. Juru attempts to calm him, revealing that he has been training Hiro for the past decade and has taken him under his wing. Meanwhile, Tomit underestimates Hiro's newfound strength, but Hiro's resolve remains unshaken. 
He queries Tomit about Nanbuko's whereabouts, but Tomit brushes off the inquiry. He describes Nanbuko as a nefarious arms dealer who causes conflict between kingdoms for personal gain, manipulating markets and bankrupting merchants with his trade in magic stones. Determined to reclaim the Grand Troa, Hiro sets his sights on finding Nanbuko. The scene shifts to Sharisharu, distraught over Nanbuko's departure and seeking solace. She turns to a magical mirror, connecting her to Nanbuko's carriage via video call. She confronts Nanbuko for abandoning her in the city, but he remains unconcerned, instructing her to locate Hiro. As hunger grows in Hiro's stomach, he desires for a lavish meal, but Palupa tells him to stay within his limits as they only have limited funds and he refuses to spend it on an extravagant restaurant. Their argument catches the attention of the restaurant owner, who harbors resentment towards them for causing a scene earlier against Nanbuko. Suddenly, a cat-eared girl named Erin intervenes, inviting them to join her for brunch. They follow her to a nearby restaurant, where they sit down to eat together. Erin, intrigued by the earlier commotion in the city square, deduces Hero's identity as Lord Barrow's son, leaving Hero and the others on edge. Abruptly, Erin takes her leave, leaving them puzzled, especially Palupa because the poor guy was expecting her to pay for their food. Later that night, Hiro and his companions take refuge in the thieves' base, much to Tomit's annoyance. The other kids, however, now see Hiro as their savior and defend his presence. Reluctantly, Tomit agrees and allows them to stay, only to find himself arguing with Hiro over sleeping arrangements. The next day, Tomit asks Hiro about their plans and the freeloader remains steadfast in his goal to find Nanbuko and retrieve the Grand Troa. Juru, however, refuses to become a bootlicker and warns Hiro of his perceived weaknesses, urging him to tread carefully in his pursuit. He is low-key calling him a crappy swordsman with big talks and no skill at all. Juru proposes that the others remain at the base temporarily while Hiro hones his skills. Though Tomit opposes the idea, Hiro assures him that Juru will take care of them and even cook for them. Reluctantly, the kids agree, and soon after, Hiro and Juru venture into the desert. In the vast expanse of the desert, Juru suggests that Hiro train at level 1 by battling simple and weak slimes. However, seemingly straightforward, Hiro struggles to even cut them in half, let alone damage them, showcasing his poor skills. Just as frustration mounts, a sand dragon emerges from the dunes, catching them off guard. Despite the fearful presence of the sand dragon, Hiro, desperate for attention, attempts to strike it, but his efforts fall short as always. Suddenly, a slender girl emerges from the dragon's mouth with a peculiar appearance. To their surprise, she approaches Hiro and lays her head on his chest, displaying an unusual level of familiarity. Furthermore, she boldly expresses her desire to accompany him on his journey, something he never would have even imagined. Kalupa's panic is palpable as the strange girl, Serato, makes her introduction while Hiro appears visibly flustered. Before they can fully process the situation, Juru launches an attack on Serato, only to be restrained by Hiro's intervention. Serato's odd behavior continues as she busies herself plucking something from the desert floor, while the others seize the opportunity to flee back to their base where Hiro takes charge and prepares a meal for them. Later, lost in thought, Hiro finds himself contemplating Serato's unusual presence. Tomit teasingly suggests that he's a desperate single guy who must be smitten with her, prompting an irritated response from Hiro. Despite his annoyance, Hiro can't shake the feeling of concern for Serato's apparent loneliness. Tomit offers some perspective, reminding him that they, too, are alone without their parents, offering condolences for Hiro's loss, even if it happened long ago. Meanwhile, in the city, Sharisharu and her soldiers continue their search for Hiro, combing every corner without success. Suddenly, to their surprise, Serato appears before them, adding another layer of mystery to an already perplexing situation. The scene changes to a floating palace situated in a land where hopes go to die. Inside, Nanbuko, the mastermind behind many sinister dealings, reviews trading reports and instructs Dr. Baharapa to prepare weapons for an impending war in his laboratory. Despite the pressing matters at hand, Dr. Baharapa for some unknown reason, expresses concern for Serato's well-being. That night, Serato mysteriously appears within the thieves' base, catching everyone off guard. Tomit experiences an average moment in the life of a Chad when he is captivated by her beauty at first however. He quickly grows irritated by her whimsical behavior. She further adds flavor to her unusual behavior by warning Hiro that she will track him down no matter where he goes, which to be honest sounds very kinky to me. Tomit then taunts Hiro, suggesting that his quest to slay Dagon Zod is now indefinitely postponed since he has found a new love interest. 
The tension between Hiro and Tomet escalates into a heated argument until Serato intervenes, finally showcasing some sanity by pulling Hiro aside to defuse the situation. The following day, Jeru and Palupa head to the market for some shopping but find themselves nearly out of funds. Meanwhile, Hiro ventures into the desert accompanied by Serato. Attempting to improve his combat skills, Hiro faces off against the slimes once more but struggles yet again. Suddenly, a wolf descends upon them, launching an attack. In a desperate attempt to impress Serato, Hiro bravely engages the wolf in battle but is swiftly overpowered and collapses. As the wolf turns its attention towards Serato, Hiro summons the last of his strength to defend her. To his surprise, Serato remains composed, and the wolf inexplicably collapses beside him. Serato, being a weirdo as always, reveals that she had merely fallen asleep before the wolf's attack. Upon noticing the wound on Hiro's shoulder, she effortlessly heals it with her magic leaving him surprised. Later, Hiro manages to sell the wolf for a golden coin, though he grumbles about the meager earnings. His mood shifts when he witnesses a man being dragged by soldiers, destined for forced labor in a magic stone mine. Unable to tolerate such injustice, he implores Serato to wait as he intervenes. Confronting the soldiers, Hiro demands they spare the man, but his efforts are met with violence as he is swiftly overwhelmed and beaten by the soldiers. After being captured, Hiro finds himself imprisoned alongside the man he tried to save. The man reveals the grim truth that those sent to the mines never return, prompting Hiro to devise an escape plan using his fake badge, much to the man's dismay. Meanwhile, Sharisharu grows frantic as her magic mirror fails to function. Learning of Hiro's capture and subsequent imprisonment in the palace, she immediately sets out to intervene. On the other hand, in a dimly lit alley, Tomet searches for a way to locate Hiro, only to be unexpectedly followed by Serato. As tensions rise, her presence adds an unexpected twist to Tomet's problematic situation. In the palace, the lord of the city erupts in anger when Nambuko interferes with his affairs. Upon discovering his ledger missing from its hiding place, the lord realizes Tomet's scheme. Threatened by his ultimatum to expose his misdeeds, the Lord faces a dilemma. Later, Tomet and Serato find themselves ambushed by the royal guards. Fortunately, Jeru and Palupa arrive just in time to retrieve the ledger, enabling them to secure Hiro's release and that of the other prisoners. The following day, Hiro attempts to dismiss Serato, urging her to leave him to his training. However, Serato persists in following him and Hiro can't stand her weirdness anymore, especially during his so-called training. In an attempt to provide for her, Hiro offers her a golden coin to purchase food. Meanwhile, Serato encounters Eren, who extends an invitation to a particular location. As Hiro trains, he grows frustrated with the repetitive task of battling slimes and implores Juru to depart, only to be met with an insulting refusal. On the other hand, Serato accompanies Eren to a hot spring, where Eren reveals rumors of its healing properties. However, she clarifies that while the water can heal wounds, it cannot resurrect the dead. Across the lake, Sharisharu observes their interaction, catching Eren's attention. Elsewhere, Tomet and Palupa stumble upon a flyer advertising a quest offering a reward of 300 golden coins for capturing a monster. Confident in their abilities with Juru by their side, they head to the training ground, only to be taken aback by the sight of Juru and Hiro locked in combat. Juru delivers a blunt reality check, stating that Hiro's reliance solely on the Grand Troa won't be sufficient to defeat Dagon Zot. He emphasizes the necessity of mastering multiple skills, reminding Hiro of the failure of a hundred mages to seal the dragon. Hiro's frustration boils over at Juru's words, leading to a physical confrontation where Hiro strikes out in anger, only to be swiftly rebuffed by Juru's unyielding defense. Palupa and Tomet rush to Hiro's side to check on him, while Juru announces his intention to take Hiro to the healing springs for treatment. Along the way, Nanbuko's guards observe their group as they make their way to the healing springs. As Hiro experiences the miraculous healing powers of the springs, he is taken aback by their potency. Meanwhile, Sharisharu detects Hiro's presence and issues a command. Juru tells Hiro that their journey encompasses more than just training. There are many tasks ahead and Hiro must demonstrate unwavering determination to succeed. As Sharisharu signals, soldiers awaken the giant octopus, unleashing chaos as it rampages through the area, capturing Serato in its path. Eren swiftly departs, leaving the scene behind as the monster wreaks havoc, attacking everyone in its vicinity, even Sharisharu herself. In a bold move, Juru charges forward and defeats the monster, saving the day. Meanwhile, Hiro searches for Serato and finds her by the lake. Sensing their moment together, Palupa and Tomet discreetly give them privacy, turning their attention elsewhere. 
With the monster subdued, they bring it to town, only to discover that the initial announcement was a ruse orchestrated by Sharisharu to capture Hiro. Undeterred, they hatch a plan to sell the monster to wealthy buyers, hoping to fund Hiro's quest for armor. However, the armor he desires proves too costly, forcing them to settle for cheaper chain mails instead. The following morning, Hiro bids farewell to the kids, ready to embark on his journey. Tomit surprises everyone by expressing his intent to join the party, despite protests from his friends. Determined to acquire the Grand Troa, Hiro promises to return and sets off with newfound resolve. On their journey, they encounter Eren, who reveals that Sharisharu was behind the monster incident the day before. She expresses her desire to join their party and offers a map revealing Nambuko's whereabouts in the land where wishes perish. However, she is a greedy woman and explains that she will only disclose this information if she is allowed to join them. Hiro is a perverted cheapskate and he readily agrees, because what is better than having more than one alley in his group, especially beautiful female ones? As Hiro and his companions press forward, they encounter a formidable obstacle in the form of a massive bird. With Tomit, Eren, Serato, and Palupa taking cover behind a stone, Hiro attempts to strike at the bird but finds himself in peril, only to be rescued by Juru's timely intervention. Recognizing the danger, Juru suggests they spend the night in the nearby forest to avoid further attacks from the bird. That evening, as they gather around a fire, Serato is notably absent, having gone to fetch water. Seizing the opportunity for a private moment, Hiro volunteers to search for her and finds her by the stream. Meanwhile, in the palace, Nanbuko showcases his weaponry to potential clients, including his latest creation. Satisfied with the demonstration, the clients purchase the weapon with crystals. Unbeknownst to Nanbuko, Sharisharu witnesses the transaction through her magic mirror, but her mood quickly sours when she learns of the bird attack on Hiro and his companions. Nanbuko reveals the existence of the massive bird, known as Hawkeye, leaving Sharisharu in a state of distress. She tries to bribe him with her cuteness but he strictly orders her to find Hiro, and threatens that if she fails, he will disown her. Meanwhile, as Hiro and his party press forward, Hawkeye returns to shadow them from above as they arrive in the salt field. Suddenly, Sharisharu and her soldiers emerge, launching a surprise ambush on Hiro and his companions. They revive three towering golems, unleashing them upon the group. Juru prepares to confront the golems in battle, while Hiro, driven by a sudden impulse, rushes towards Sharisharu in a state of frenzy. However, his reckless move proves disastrous as Sharisharu retaliates with her lightning magic, causing Hiro to collapse instantly. Undeterred by Hiro's plight, Juru charges forward, engaging the soldiers and golems with remarkable skill and agility. Despite his efforts, Hiro finds himself unable to retaliate effectively, and his sword is ultimately torn to pieces by Sharisharu's relentless assault. In a desperate move, Palupa invokes his magic and summons Mumu, a rabbit-like girl known for her openness to bribery. Mumu emerges from a magical chest, and in a sudden turn of events, Palupa tosses both Serato and Tomit into the chest, much to Tomit's concern for the others. Meanwhile, Hiro finds himself cornered by Sharisharu's relentless assault, with Juru coming to his aid. As the battle intensifies, the earth trembles under the force of their clashes, and Juru becomes ensnared by Sharisharu's powerful magic. In a cruel twist, Sharisharu threatens to kill Juru if Hiro does not comply. Fueled by rage and desperation, Hiro's emotions boil over, causing him to undergo a monstrous transformation. With uncontrollable power at his disposal, he unleashes a devastating attack, wiping out the soldiers and striking fear into Sharisharu's heart. However, in the midst of his rampage, his strength diminishes, his mind confuses, and he collapses, losing consciousness. As Hiro regains consciousness, he finds himself confronted by Nanbuko and his subordinates, but his weakened state leaves him disoriented and unsure of his surroundings. Recollections of a strange vision during his unconsciousness flicker in his mind. Meanwhile, Mumu and the magical chest reappear, with Serato setting out to search for Hiro while Palupa reluctantly parts with a hefty sum to fulfill Mumu's demands. Elsewhere, Nanbuko meets with his buyer, an individual adorned in lavish attire, eager to inspect Nanbuko's offerings. In the background, a green orc is bound to a cross while three men are shackled nearby. Unbeknownst to them, the doctor is in the midst of preparing his invention when a sudden burst of red light envelops the orc and the men. To their astonishment, the individuals merge into a monstrous entity, prompting a sense of praise from the woman witnessing Nanbuko's success in combining humans and an orc. 
as Hiro secretly observes the scene. The doctor expresses his disappointment at the miscalculation, expecting the monster to be stronger. Suddenly, Hiro emerges from the shadows, confronting Nanbuko and challenging him to a duel. With both parties prepared for combat, Hiro realizes he no longer possesses his sword. Undeterred, Hiro engages Nanbuko in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but his efforts prove futile as he is swiftly overpowered. Despite his defeat, Hiro demands the return of Grand Troa, only to be met with Nambuko's assertion that the artifact rightfully belongs to him. As Hiro is captured by the soldiers, Nambuko informs him that he is being invited to a special gathering. Meanwhile, Juru ponders over Hiro's mysterious ability to destroy their enemies and Eren suddenly appears, much to Palupa's annoyance. Afterwards, Juru, Tomit, and Serato are escorted to a luxurious tent, leaving Eren and Palupa behind. Meanwhile, outside the tent, Nanbuko attends to his buyer, who is preparing a lavish feast. Sharisharu rushes to Nanbuko to apologize for her failure to capture Hiro, but to her surprise, Nanbuko commends Hiro's strength and rewards Sharisharu and her men with a bag of money. Overwhelmed with joy, Sharisharu embraces Nanbuko in gratitude. Back at the trial grounds, Juru and the others observe the half-human orc, leading Juru to suspect Nanbuko's involvement in the creature's creation. In the tent, Hiro finds himself bound to a chair as Nambuko enters, displaying torturous implements with the intention of extracting Hiro's secrets through pain. Curiosity piqued, Nambuko asks Hiro about his connection to Dagon Zot, the malevolent dragon. In response, Hiro questions why a mere merchant like Nanbuko would be interested in such an evil entity. Nanbuko reveals his rationale, explaining that the chaos wrought by Dagon Zot's actions will create a demand for weapons across many countries, thereby increasing his profits. Before Nanbuko can commence his interrogation, a disturbance erupts outside the tent. His buyer, furious by being addressed disrespectfully, causes a scene. Seizing the opportunity, Hiro capitalizes on the distraction managing to free his leg and retrieve his badge. With nimble fingers, he uses the badge to cut the ropes binding his hands, setting himself free. Meanwhile, the doctor carefully tinkers with his latest invention, but his sensors detect Serato's presence nearby. Puzzled, he sets out to investigate her whereabouts. Inside the tent, Hiro manages to free his hand from the rope, though he stumbles as his left hand remains bound. Suddenly, the doctor enters the tent, carrying his sensor, and is taken aback by Hiro's scent reminding him of Serato. He inquires about Serato's location, unaware that Hiro is secretly cutting the rope on his arm. Outside the tent, Sharisharu and the soldiers revel in a party celebrating Nanbuko's supposed benevolence. Meanwhile, the doctor remains skeptical of Serato's supposed interest in Hiro's heartbeat. Eventually, Hiro frees his arm and seizes the opportunity to confront the doctor. Despite the doctor's persistent ramblings about Serato and Hiro's connection, Hiro realizes Serato's fate is intertwined with his own. The doctor, acknowledging this bond, implores Hiro to care for Serato. However, Hiro expresses doubt, fearing he cannot fulfill this promise amidst Nanbuko's torture. In a surprising turn, the doctor offers Hiro poison, suggesting it as a means to reunite with Serato beyond the confines of their current difficulty. At first, the young boy hesitates, grappling with the gravity of his decision before finally consuming the poison. Outside the tent, Juru and the others observe as Hiro falls from above, prompting Juru to urge a swift departure without diving into inquiries. Inside the tent, Nanbuko boils with fury towards the professor, who defiantly challenges Nanbuko to end his life. However, Nanbuko acknowledges the doctor's value despite their confrontation, recognizing the necessity of the doctor's skills. Unconcerned, the doctor remains steadfast as his resolve is fueled by the desire to protect Hiro for Serato's sake. Nanbuko, intrigued, questions whether Hiro is aware of Serato's true identity. Nevertheless, he discloses that he will get rid of Serato as soon as possible and this news causes tears in the doctor's eyes. The scene changes to an old mine, where Eren reveals that extensive mining operations are underway to procure magic stones. Serato approaches Hiro and detects the distinctive scent of Dr. Baharapa. Meanwhile, Juru tries to comprehend the doctor's cryptic remarks regarding Hiro's heart, which appears to be distinct from his own and potential potentially linked to Dagon Zot. Juru hypothesizes that a heart swap may have occurred between Hiro and Dagon Zot, explaining the irregularity in Hiro's heartbeat. This theory suggests that Hiro's father, driven by despair, may have orchestrated the exchange, perhaps in a bid to unleash hidden powers within Hiro. These powers manifest when Hiro experiences intense emotions like anger and despair, causing him to temporarily transform into a monstrous entity. 
While Jeru remains cautious about the theory, it resonates with the events they've witnessed during their travels. Hero speculates that if he were to perish, Dagon Zot might meet the same fate. Driven by a deep-seated desire to avenge his parents' tragic demise, Hero resolves to confront his mortality head-on. In a cathartic outburst, he unleashes his pent-up fury and storms outside. Jeru and Palupa trail behind him, but Eren's attempt to accompany them is intercepted by Tomit, who deems the matter too personal for her involvement. Meanwhile, in the palace, Sharisharu revels in the gift bestowed upon her by Nanbuko. However, her restlessness causes her to dispatch her winged eyes to secretly monitor Hiro's movements. As Hiro reaches a desolate village, Juru is struck by a sudden recollection, leaving him visibly stunned. Tomit remarks on the eerie atmosphere of the village, prompting Juru to affirm his suspicions and urge the others to survey the damage before making any decisions about staying. While exploring the village, Juru is confronted with a haunting vision from his past. He glimpses the silhouette of his childhood, triggering memories of the harrowing ordeal his parents endured. They were subjected to torment and persecution because his mother was human while his father bore a resemblance to a monstrous creature. The denizens of the monster village harbored suspicions that his mother was the catalyst for the village's misfortunes. Despite the accusations, Juru's mother staunchly defended his father. In a poignant moment, Juru's father called out to him, imparting the timeless lesson that a true hero never forsakes a noble cause. Tragically, Juru's parents were unjustly executed together, leaving a profound mark on Juru's psyche. In another part of the village, Tomic continues his exploration and stumbles upon piles of lifeless bodies. Above him, a lurking monster observes his movements, then launches a sudden attack. Juru is flooded with memories of the past, recalling the heroic actions of Barrow that saved him, as well as the tender moment he first laid eyes on the infant hero. Abruptly, Tomit races towards them, pursued by an ugly fusion of humans and orcs. Despite the looming threat, Hero steps forward to confront the monster, only to realize his foolishness that he no longer possesses his sword. With swift precision, Juru swings his sword, intercepting the monster's onslaught and shielding his companions from harm. Hero, recognizing his own vulnerability, cautions Juru that he has yet to fully recuperate from his previous ordeal. As the monster redirects its focus towards Hero, Tomit implores him to tap into his Dagon Zot form for defense. However, despite his efforts, Hero struggles to transform, leaving him vulnerable to the creature's assault. In a decisive moment, the monster launches a devastating attack on Hero, prompting Tomit's urgent plea. Yet, as the peril escalates, Juru intervenes once more, coming to Hero's rescue and swiftly dispatching the monstrous foe. On the other hand, Eren meets Sharisharu to meet the evil merchant. Eren turns out to be a rat as she informs Nanbuko that Hero possesses the heart of Dagon Zot. The merchant refuses to believe her at first but she tells him that it is her job to distribute valuable information in exchange for money. Impressed, Nanbuko gives her an expensive item and later, he calls out Sharisharu only to order her to kill Hero. In the vibrant Rukano village, Tomit finds himself captivated by its lively atmosphere despite its location on the outskirts. Palupa explains that the village thrives due to its strategic intersection. Hiro expresses his desire to acquire a new sword, but Juru suggests selling the crocodile first before making any purchases, cautioning Hiro to be mindful of their finances. As evening descends, Tomit inquires about their plans for the following day, prompting Juru to advocate for some much-needed rest. While Juru busies himself studying the map and planning their journey in his quarters, Hiro engages him in conversation, seeking to understand Juru's demeanor during their encounter in the village earlier. Juru reassures him, stating that he was merely fulfilling his duty to protect Hiro, though Hiro senses there may be more to Juru's thoughts. At the stroke of midnight, chaos erupts as a monstrous shadow descends upon the village, wreaking havoc and destruction. As the shadow reveals its true form, Dagon Zod emerges, casting a deadly aura that threatens all who cross its path. Enraged by the devastation, Hiro moves to confront the creature, but Juru intervenes, urging caution. However, as the monster unleashes another assault, it becomes evident that this is not the true Dagon Zot. Just then, Sharisharu appears, disclosing that the monstrous entity is an invention of Dr. Baharapa. Serato urgently alerts her companions that the looming threat is not Dagon Zot. Meanwhile, at the palace, Dr. Baharapa and Nanbuko observe the unfolding battle, with the doctor expressing confidence in his plan to manipulate Hiro. 
As Jeru becomes ensnared by the shadow monster, Sharisharu launches an attack on Hiro with her lightning-infused umbrella, causing Dr. Baharapa to panic as he realizes the significance of Hiro's connection to Serato. Despite the chaos, Nanbuko remains indifferent, focused solely on luring Dagon Zot. Hiro, overwhelmed by the onslaught, succumbs to the fear and anger within him, awakening the dormant power of the dragon within. His unleashed fury sends Sharisharu and her companions flying, leaving Tomit and Sarada in awe of his newfound dragon form. As Hiro grapples with his inner turmoil, Jiru finds himself consumed by the shadow, only to be rescued by Eren's timely intervention. Sharisharu vanishes from the scene as the true Dagon Zot materializes before them. In his fury, Hiro, now in control of his dragon form, inadvertently strikes Jiru with his sword, causing Serato to feel a sharp pain in her heart. The sheer force of Hiro's inner power causes all the mirrors in Nanbuko's chamber to shatter, signaling the extent of his unleashed energy. Eventually, Hiro regains his senses, and Dagon Zot slowly fades away. Nanbuko realizes that to capture Dagon Zot, he must first subdue Hiro, leaving Jiru lying helplessly on the ground as Hiro and his companions rush to his side, overcome with emotion. As Hiro watches over Jiru, who remains unconscious in the hostel, Serato joins him, offering silent support. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Palupa expresses dissatisfaction with the taste of the food he's prepared. Suddenly, Jiru awakens, bringing a sense of relief to Hiro. Despite his recovery, Jiru notices the smell of Palupa's cooking, acknowledging his efforts. Hiro's guilt weighs heavily upon him for his attack on Jiru, but both Jiru and Palupa reassure him that it was his Dagon form, not his true self that struck Jiru. Nevertheless, Hiro is deeply affected by the incident, saddened by the harm caused to his friend. Hiro's concern grows as Serato explains the dangers of healing Jiru's injuries and the potential risks of Hiro's dragon form overtaking him completely. The fear of losing his humanity to the dragon within him terrifies Hiro. Jiru suggests seeking guidance from Master Theo, believing he may have insight into their situation. But he loses consciousness once more. Meanwhile, downstairs, Palupa and Mumu clash over the costly medicine needed to treat Jiru's condition. Mumu reveals that the medicine requires rare Serifuria herbs, boiling down their hopes of a cheaper alternative. Tomit suggests returning to the healing springs, but Palupa fears it may not be enough to save Jiru's life. Just then, Eren emerges with a solution, offering directions to the herbs in Kururu Arua Canyon. Despite Hiro's urgency, Eren shares the location, providing a glimmer of hope as the group prepares to embark on their quest to save Jiru. As Hiro and Serato venture towards Kururu Arua Canyon, Hiro expresses his frustration at the distance they must travel. Serato reassures him, mentioning that her own well-being is intact despite the journey's length. Back at the hostel, Eren grimly informs the group of Jiru's worsening condition. Palupa calculates their financial constraints, while Tomit voices his growing suspicions about Serato. He notes her peculiar behavior, including her lack of appetite during their travels. Tomit's doubts are compounded by Serato's seemingly convenient appearances and her association with Dr. Baharapa, who serves Nanbuko's interests. Additionally, Tomit observes that Serato rarely smiles, adding to his distrust. Meanwhile, Hiro and Serato have reached Kururu Arua Canyon, where they hope to find the rare herbs needed to save Jiru's life. In the canyon, Hiro and Serato find themselves facing a giant toad that suddenly appears and attacks them. Serato acts quickly, pushing Hiro out of harm's way as they attempt to evade the creature. Their escape is hindered by a sudden downpour, making the terrain slippery. Despite the obstacles, Serato spots a Serifuria plant, and Hiro heads towards it with determination. Back at the hostel, Eren relays alarming news to the group, revealing that Nanbuko plans to kill Hiro. She explains that she overheard this information through a device used for communication. Halupa is puzzled by Nanbuko's motives for targeting Hiro, and Eren suggests that it may be related to Hiro's connection to Dagon Zot. Meanwhile, as Hiro struggles to reach the Serifuria, the hill where the plant grows unexpectedly shifts away, complicating their task further. As Hiro struggles to retrieve the Serifuria from the elusive glow tortoise, back at the hostel, the group discusses Hiro's connection to Nanbuko's plans. They realize that Hiro's visit to Nanbuko's place is tied to his inheritance from his father, as well as the fact that he carries the heart of the creature responsible for his parents' deaths. 
Aaron adds to their concerns by revealing that Nanbuko orchestrated a hoax about Dagon Zot's capture, intending to sow discord among the three kingdoms. The group understands that this misinformation will likely lead to increased weapon and armor orders, along with a rise in magic stone prices due to Nanbuko's monopoly. Halupa fears that these developments may escalate into a continent-wide war. Meanwhile, Hiro continues to struggle with the Glow Tortoise, prompting Eren to warn the group about the increasingly difficult journey ahead. Despite the potential dangers, she refuses any reward for her information, simply requesting a cup of tea in return. In the canyon, Hiro successfully retrieves the Seraphuria, but as he falls from the Glow Tortoise's shell, Serato catches him, leading to a moment of relief and shared smiles between them. Back at the hostel, Hiro presents the boiled Seraphuria to Juru, and as he consumes it, mystical lights appear, and Juru regains consciousness. Outside the room, Tomit enters and shares a troubling report with the others. He reveals that children in the town are being coerced into mining magic stones, a situation that suggests the imminent outbreak of war. As they resume their journey, Tomic confides in Palupa that he's lost trust in Serato after witnessing her crying in the hostel the previous night. He now believes more in the mysterious girl they encountered earlier. Meanwhile, Tomit expresses his fear of the impending war and his desire to obtain the Grand Troa. However, Juru reminds him of the importance of finding Master Theo. Suddenly, a dignified man appears, and Juru and Palupa kneel before him. Palupa introduces himself as Barrow's servant, and the man reveals himself to be Master Theo. Master Theo's arrival brings a mix of emotions, as he greets Serato warmly, causing Hiro to feel a twinge of jealousy. Despite the momentary discomfort, they continue their journey. However, the thin air proves challenging for everyone, leaving them breathless. Master Theo, ever observant, notes their struggle and points out that Barrow and Palupa, his disciples, never seem to face such difficulties. Palupa apologizes for their lack of a present, while Juru respectfully states their intention to discuss something important with Master Theo. As they delve deeper into the cave, Juru lays out the troubling reality of Hero's potential transformation into a dragon. Master Theo listens intently, his wisdom emanating from his presence. With a gesture, he summons forth a powerful energy, demonstrating the soul-destroying flames akin to Dagon Zot's devastating attacks. The old man delves into the tragic history of the failed sealing ritual, and the crucial role of Dagon Zot's heart, which now beats within Hero. Despite his vast knowledge, Master Theo admits he lacks guidance on this matter. Hero, grappling with his emotions, speaks out with his voice tinged with frustration. He confronts Master Theo about his absence during the sealing ceremony, and questions why he didn't intervene to aid his parents. This moment of confrontation crackles with tension as Hero seeks answers to the questions burning within him. Master Theo's explanation echoes with deep wisdom as he explains the impossibility of sealing Dagon Zot even with his presence. He extends an invitation to Hiro to embark on a journey of magical training, recognizing its potential to aid him in grappling with his dragon form. As they emerge from the cave, Master Theo creates tasks for each member of the group, a subtle guidance tailored to their strengths and needs. Stepping forward, Hiro finds himself confronted with a difficult task, following a twisty line to uncover a straight path within his steps. It's a metaphorical journey, designed to cultivate a deeper understanding of oneself amidst life's complexities. Yet, as he grapples with this concept, Hiro finds himself confronted with a simple and profound exercise, crumpling and uncrumpling a picture, mirroring the intricate journey of self-discovery and transformation he is embarking upon. Palupa finds himself grappling with the depth of Master Theo's teachings, struggling to grasp their significance. Meanwhile, Eren diligently monitors reports from Nanbuko's palace, her heart heavy with the weight of impending war. As tensions escalate, she fears the inevitable outbreak of conflict. In the midst of their training, Palupa urges Hiro to maintain his focus, emphasizing the importance of concentration. Yet, Master Theo's guidance takes an unexpected turn as he instructs Hiro to discard the paper bearing Serato's likeness, prompting protest from the young boy who clings to it as a cherished memory. Suspicious of the budding relationship between Hiro and Serato, Master Theo observes their interactions keenly. Amidst this, Juru returns with his prey, a testament to his prowess in the wild. However, the focus shifts once again as Master Theo directs Hiro's attention to a seemingly tough task, picking up a pebble. Serato's perspective on the gold coin as a beautiful pebble adds a unique twist to the exercise 
highlighting her perspective on the apparent difficulty. Intrigued, Master Theo instructs Hero to throw the pebble to a location of his choosing. As the pebble is cast, emitting a faint light Master Theo's interest is piqued. Sensing a challenge, Hero confronts Master Theo, who eagerly accepts the challenge. Meanwhile, in the palace, Sharisharu grapples with a sense of sadness with her emotions swirling within her. Despite her inner disruption, she remains modest and when her servant inquires about her desires, she can only shake her head in response. She is unable to explain the source of her sadness. Instead, she calls out Nanbuko's name, seeking perhaps a source of comfort or guidance amidst her inner anxiety. In front of the cave, Master Theo imparts wisdom about the Koku Blade, demonstrating its power without the physical presence of a sword. Hiro is initially skeptical but attempts the technique nonetheless, surprising himself when his attack connects with the stone. Despite this success, Hiro remains unaware of the significance of his achievement. Meanwhile, in the palace, Sharisharu weakly interacts with her servant before being summoned by Nanbuko. Excited by the prospect, she eagerly heads to meet him. Inside the cave, Juru seeks guidance from Master Theo regarding Hiro. Theo describes Hiro's character traits and affirms that while Hiro may not excel in swordsmanship, his true talent lies in magic. Juru acknowledges this but expresses his desire to continue training Hiro in swordsmanship, wanting to support him. Master Theo assures Juru that together they can complement each other's strengths, with Juru's expertise in swordsmanship and Hiro's proficiency in magic. In the palace, Nanbuko is engrossed in monitoring his machine when Sharisharu arrives. He informs her that he has a task for her, prompting suspicion from one of the soldiers. Outside the cave, Master Theo instructs Hiro to assume his stance, but the young warrior is fatigued and frustrated. Theo challenges him to strike with the Koku Blade, promising graduation if successful. Hiro launches an attack, and Theo fakes an injury. Despite Hiro's belief that he has mastered swordsmanship, they continue their journey. Unbeknownst to them, Master Theo discreetly activates a defensive magic barrier when Hiro attacks. Eventually, they arrive in the Mort Desert. Amidst their journey, they face an attack from a Hawkeye, but Juru successfully repels it. However, Eren collapses, dropping her device in the process. Suspicions arise when they hear her communicating with the enemy, leading them to realize she's the spy. Juru confronts her, and Eren confesses to being an information broker who sells her intelligence to Nanbuko. Despite the betrayal, Juru decides against harming her, believing it won't compensate for their losses. In the end, they leave Eren stranded in the desert, though she warns them of dire consequences to come. In the palace, despite her guard's concerns, Sharisharu is determined to fulfill Nanbuko's task. She enters the machine, where she and Dr. Baharapa have joined forces. Meanwhile, as night falls in the Mort Desert, Hiro and his companions grumble about the extreme temperatures. Juru reminds them that they need to prepare for three nights in the desert, where the temperature fluctuates drastically between scorching days and freezing nights. As they continue traversing the desert amid the sandstorm, the group faces challenges. Meanwhile, in the Saint Amoria Kingdom, the knights are preparing for war. Believing that Van Lodes and Ischelfine have formed an alliance and that Dagon Zot is under their control. In the desert, Hiro and his companions find themselves running out of water, and Palupa falls into a sand hole. Inside, they encounter a grotesque and formidable monster. Juru instructs Palupa not to move to avoid sinking deeper, but despite his efforts, Palupa panics and sinks further. Unable to help him, the group is surprised when Aaron, the blabbermouth girl throws a rope to save Palupa. Though Palupa is saved, he remains angry with Aaron, who explains that they are drifting farther from their intended destination. In the Ishilfin kingdom, the king has been engaged in prayer for three consecutive days. There's a prevailing fear that Van Lodes and Saint Amoria have aligned against them, and they're also concerned about the potential capture of Dagon Zot. Meanwhile, in the Mort Desert, Hero's group is caught in a sandstorm, causing them to become separated. Palupa regains consciousness to find Eren beside him. She explains that she has only located Palupa and has lost track of the others. Despite Palupa's concern for their companions, Eren suggests heading towards the oasis, believing that they may reunite with the others there. Determined not to perish in the desert, Eren presses forward, urging Palupa to follow her lead. Jeru encounters Tomit, while Hiro and Serato are separated from the rest of the group. As they continue their journey, Palupa struggles to walk but declines Aaron's offer to carry his bag. Aaron defends herself, explaining that she only sells information to those willing to pay a high price. She admits to approaching Nanbuko in an attempt to acquire the Grand Troa, but Palupa is overwhelmed and collapses. Meanwhile, Hiro and Serato endure the cold air together, with Serato appearing visibly concerned. 
The following morning, Aaron and Palupa awaken, and Palupa notices a bug collecting dew on its body. He tries to mimic the behavior but fails. Hiro, meanwhile, is shivering and desperately in need of water, unsure of what to do next. Serato catches a whiff of the nearby lake on the wind and begins to undress. Elsewhere, Juru carries Tomit on his back and spots Aaron and Palupa in the distance. They reunite as a group once again, as Serato collects droplets on her body and offers them to Hiro. He is briefly reminded of his mother. Meanwhile, a Hawkeye watches them from afar. Juru and the others finally reach the oasis, where Juru provides Tomit with water, helping him regain consciousness. However, their moment of relief is short-lived as Sharasharu suddenly appears in her fusion form. She attacks Serato and abducts Hiro before their eyes. Elsewhere, the three kingdoms continue to prepare for war. Hiro awakens in Nambuko's palace, where the weapon merchant reveals his intention to revive Dagon Zot after ten years. Nambuko, unfazed by Hiro's rage, mocks him further, claiming that the Grand Troa rightfully belongs to him now. In a fit of anger, Hiro draws his sword and strikes at Nambuko, but the enemy effortlessly blocks the attack. It becomes clear to Hiro that defeating Nambuko won't be as simple as he thought. As Nanbuko drops this bombshell of truth, revealing his own culpability in the tragedy of ten years prior, Hiro's rage intensifies. He refuses to accept Nanbuko's denial regarding the heart-switching incident, insisting that it was indeed his father, Lord Barrow, who made the decision. Despite his anger, Hiro attacks Nanbuko once more, but he is swiftly overpowered and thrown out into the unforgiving desert once again. The weight of Nanbuko's revelation and Hiro's failure weighs heavily on him as he struggles to make sense of the truth. As Juru and the others search for Hiro and Serato, Eren uses her device to listen in, hoping to pick up any clues. Suddenly, they hear Serato's voice calling out for Hiro. Following the sound, they find Serato hitting drums in an attempt to summon the dragon. To their shock, the dragon emerges and devours Serato. Panic ensues among the group, with Juru nearly attacking the dragon in his distress. However, Serato manages to calm them down, assuring them that the dragon will lead them to Hiro. Palupa recalls that Serato first appeared alongside a dragon, further deepening the mystery surrounding her. As the party rides the dragon, they soar towards Nanbuko's palace. Meanwhile, inside the palace, Nanbuko ensures that all preparations are complete. He plans to merge the sealing treasure with his device, believing that doing so will grant him dominion over the world. However, he acknowledges that achieving this goal requires sacrificing all the magic power in the entire realm. Undeterred by the enormity of the task, Nanbuko remains determined to see his ambitions realized even at the cost of immense sacrifice. As they arrive at Nanbuko's mansion, Serato and the others find themselves facing a structure reminiscent of the Dark Lord's palace. Eren explains the history behind the palace, detailing its previous ruler Gyrokias and his defeat by the hero Dalhalbart. Despite its ruined state, the palace still retains powerful magic, now utilized by Nanbuko. Their arrival doesn't go unnoticed, however, as they are swiftly attacked upon landing, with the dragon being slain on the ground. Surrounded by guards, the group must quickly formulate a plan to evade capture. Juru and the others manage to slip away before they are discovered, but they are uncertain about how to proceed further. Dr. Baharapa drops a bombshell, revealing Serato's true nature as a magic puppet created under Nanbuko's command. Palupa is shocked by this revelation. The doctor further explains that Serato's creation is tied to the Balbagoa tragedy, during which Nanbuko implanted the dragon blood crystal inside her body. However, because Nanbuko didn't appreciate Serato's beauty, he ordered her destruction. In a desperate bid to survive, Serato froze the magma lake and managed to escape her impending demise. The group finds themselves in a difficult situation as they confront Nanbuko and Sharisharu in the room with the giant crystal. Despite Hiro's warnings and pleas to leave, his friends refuse to abandon him. Serato, displaying selflessness, offers herself as a surrender in exchange for Hiro's release. However, Nanbuko reveals that he needs both Serato and Hiro for his grand plan to unfold. As the solar eclipse casts its shadow over Balbagoa, Nanbuko's sinister plan reaches its climax. With the convergence of celestial events, Nanbuko intends to utilize all the gathered magic power to fuse soldiers from the Three Kingdoms with the essence of Dagon Zot creating a monstrous entity even more formidable than the evil dragon itself. Meanwhile, the sphere surrounding Nanbuko's mansion seals shut, trapping everyone inside. Sharisharu, realizing the imminent danger, sends all the accumulated magic power to Dr. Baharapa, believing Nanbuko will spare her life. However, Nanbuko appears and dispels any hope of salvation, 
declaring that everyone within the mansion will become part of his grand scheme. With this chilling revelation, the situation becomes all too clear to those caught within Nanbuko's grasp. As the situation escalates within the mansion, Sharusharu's initial confidence turns to rage as she realizes the true extent of Nanbuko's treachery. Meanwhile, Juru confronts Dr. Baharapa, seeking answers about the source of the fear that holds the magic inside. The doctor reveals that his true body resides in Balbagoa, and the current form he inhabits is merely a puppet. Juru's pride quickly turns to dismay as Dr. Baharapa attacks him, causing him to collapse. Nambuko, seizing the opportunity, uses his magic to summon Serato and commands her to obey his orders. Serato, under Nambuko's control, undergoes a drastic transformation, becoming a vessel for spreading terror. However, Nambuko's plans are thwarted momentarily as the heart of Dagon Zod inside Serato ceases to beat. Despite the chaos and crumbling mansion, Palupa desperately seeks Mumu's assistance. However, Mumu demands a high price for her help, leaving Palupa and the others to pool together whatever resources they have in a desperate bid for survival. As chaos reigns inside the sphere, Mumu prepares to fire the magic cannon, hoping to create an opening for their escape. With a powerful blast, the cannon pierces the sphere, allowing Palupa, Juru, and the others to flee to safety in Balbagoa. Meanwhile, in Balbagoa, Hiro stands on the brink of transformation into a dragon, a crucial step in Nanbuko's plan to summon the Dark Lord. Enraged by the situation and the manipulation he's endured, Hiro launches an attack. However, before he can harm Serato or unleash his full power, Juru and the rest of the group arrive, intervening to separate the two and prevent further conflict. As Juru moves to approach Hiro and Serato, eager to intervene and stop the conflict, Sharisharu steps in to block his path. Despite being on the verge of death at Nanbuko's hands, she remains loyal to him, willing to obey his commands without question. Nanbuko himself watches the unfolding battle between Hiro and Serato with twisted satisfaction, finding beauty in the strife between two individuals bound by fate. As Serato manages to subdue Hiro and prevent him from further harming her, she restrains him and forcefully pins him to the ground. Despite Juru's desire to aid Hiro, Sharasharu intervenes, preventing him from intervening and nearly delivering a fatal blow to Hiro herself. Suddenly, Sharasharu is hurled away by an unseen force, revealing the appearance of Dagon Zot, who shields Hiro from harm. Nanbuko, witnessing the activation of his magic reactor and the appearance of Dagon Zot, is delighted by the unfolding events. Nanbuko then proceeds to imprison Dagon Zot within the Grand Troa, intending to fuse himself with the dragon using the magic reactor. As the fusion process commences, a tremendous surge of energy emanates from Balbagoa, signaling the beginning of the fusion. However, instead of utilizing the soldiers as planned, Nanbuko decides to sacrifice himself to complete the fusion with Dagon Zot. As Dr. Baharapa witnesses Nanbuko's unexpected move, he realizes the dire situation. Hiro, driven by a surge of power from his parents and other absorbed lives, attempts to counterattack. But Nanbuko easily overpowers him, sending him crashing to the ground. Despite his valiant efforts, Hiro collapses under Nanbuko's relentless assault. Feeling the urgency of the situation, Eren and Tomit implore Dr. Baharapa to intervene and stop Nanbuko. Recognizing the gravity of the moment, the doctor instructs them to retrieve the magical reactor and disrupt the ongoing ritual. As Serato regains consciousness, she finds Hiro still lying vulnerable while Nanbuko prepares to unleash the final blow, harnessing Dagon Zot's true power. Meanwhile, Dr. Baharapa, Eren, and Tomit act swiftly to take control of the reactors and initiate their destruction. With their timely intervention, the balance of power is disrupted, throwing Nanbuko's plans into disarray. Despite their efforts, Nanbuko remains undeterred, persistent on carrying out his destructive intentions. He summons the soul-destroying flame, aimed to unleash its devastating force upon Hiro. In a moment of desperation and determination, Hiro summons the strength to act, driven by a mix of grief, anger, and resolve. Witnessing Serato sacrifice herself to save him, he is overwhelmed with emotion. As Nanbuko moves to execute his final, devastating attack, Hiro finds the courage to strike back, severing Nanbuko's arm in a swift and decisive move. He finally confronts Nanbuko head-on, piercing his heart with his sword, despite the villain's disbelief that a mere human could inflict such a wound. With the Grand Troa in hand, Hiro summons all his remaining strength and courage. He confronts the mighty Dagon Zot, knowing that his own heart lies within the dragon's formidable form. As Dagon Zot looms over him, Hiro makes a bold decision. 
He uses the power of the Grand Troa to wield the Koku Blade, the very weapon that had once sealed the dragon's power. In a decisive strike, Hero plunges the blade into Dagon Zot's heart. With a mighty roar, the dragon's form begins to tremble. As the blade pierces through Dagon Zot's chest, Hero's heart is released from the dragon's grasp, soaring free from its ancient prism. In a moment of triumph and relief, Hero welcomes his heart back, feeling the weight of his burden lift as he embraces his restored self. As Hero gazes upon the lifeless form of Serato, Jeru's suggestion echoes in his mind. With a heavy heart, he approaches her and makes a solemn decision. Placing his hand over Serato's chest, Hero summons the courage to transfer his own heart into her body. A miraculous transformation occurs as Serato comes back to life. With a gentle warmth, Hero's heart beats once again within her, bringing her back from the brink of death. In a breathtaking display, the dragon's form begins to disappear, vanishing into a shower of graceful light that scatters into the sky above. As the darkness ends, the brilliance of sunlight pierces through the once shadowed land of Balbagoa. Amidst the aftermath, Paluper reaches for the shattered remains of the Grand Troa, his eyes glowing with thoughts of wealth and fortune. Yet, Aaron and Tomit, driven by their own desires, engage in a struggle over the broken relic. In the chaos, the Grand Troa slips from their grasp and falls to the ground, fracturing into irreparable pieces. As Jeru uncovers the truth about the object they believe to be the Grand Troa, Palupa struggles to accept the revelation. However, Jeru explains that Hero's hidden magical abilities allowed him to wield the heirloom effectively against Nanbuko. This realization dawns on them during Hero's training with Master Theo, revealing the depths of Hero's untapped potential. Serato, witnessing Hero's tears, is taken aback by his emotional display causing him to become flustered in her presence. Despite her surprise, she searches for Dr. Baharapa, only to learn that her father did not survive the battle. Meanwhile, the soldiers of the Three Kingdoms retreat, signaling the end of the conflict. Eren's intervention, fueled by her connections to the kings, ensures peace across the land. In a surprising turn of events, Mumu appears, reminding them of their debt amidst the newfound tranquility. On the other hand, Sharisharu's tears give way to joy as she learns of a freed girl, reborn and empowered by fusion. Embracing her newfound happiness, Sharisharu rejoices in the revelation. As they bid farewell to Dr. Baharapa with a solemn burial, Tomiite and the others tease Hiro for his selfless act of giving his heart to Serato. Despite the banter, they part ways on good terms. However, Hiro rejects the label of a mage, choosing instead to embrace his identity as a wandering swordsman. 